you know, the world hasn't come to an end. And I think the Fed's posture will switch from, hey, work with your borrowers to start pushing the envelope. And what I think will be interesting this time is you know, going into the financial crisis, like 80% debt was like standard leverage, at least in CMBS world. And you pushed up from there and banks were throwing around 70, 75. And so the the loss was affected the lender, right? There's no question the lender was underwater. Mm -hmm. Put office aside for a second. A lot of properties, the impairment is within the equity stack. The lender is still money good. So the lender will work with their borrower for a period of time, you know, be accommodating. They don't want to shake things up, but there will be a moment where the lender says, well, wait a second, I've given this borrower a year of extensions. I can't do new loans at 7%. I'm sitting with this loan at three and a half. Mm -hmm. And it, I feel bad that the borrower is going to lose their money, but I don't feel that bad. So guess what? It's time to go. It's time to sell. Let's put it out to market. And we're seeing some of that, but I think that's going to start happening more in the next couple of years. Hi, Adam Gower here, founder of GowerCrowd.com and a host of the Real Estate Reality Show at YouTube.com forward slash GowerCrowd and on all major podcast channels everywhere. My guest today is David Moret, who is founder and president of Highline Real Estate Capital based in Miami, Florida. David just set up a new fund that is focused on opportunistic acquisitions and investments in the Southeast with, a, with, a, with an emphasis on the Florida market. And he's going to share with you today what he sees about that market being different from other markets, where he sees opportunities emerging. He talks in detail about the office markets and about multifamily and where opportunities will be. I did ask him at the end of the conversation to make some predictions. So stick around for that. He's going to talk about where he sees uh, the market evolving over the next few months and where the opportunities or when the opportunities are more likely to emerge. David also makes some interesting comparisons with the global financial crisis of uh, 2008 to what, 2010, 2011 and describes where he sees the similarities today and the differences today. If you want to know more about David, go to gowcrowd.com to the podcast page where we will include links to his uh, company website and to his LinkedIn profile. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe to our weekly newsletter. There's a big red button on the page somewhere there. Click on that. You'll also see some of the other subscribers to our newsletter. So you'll know what kind of company you will be keeping. It's an interesting list. Go ahead and take a look at that there and subscribe at gowercrowd.com. All right. Now, without further ado, here he is, David Moret, founder and president at Highline Real Estate Capital. David, thanks so much for joining me today. I read that really interesting article in uh, in The Real Deal uh, that uh, was heavily focused on uh, what you guys are doing there in Florida. So I'd like you to tell me a little, if you don't mind, uh, about uh, the Highline Real Estate Fund 1. Uh, that you've just launched. What are you seeing in the market? Actually, first tell me, what is the objective of the fund? And then we'll move on to why you've even set it up. Absolutely, absolutely. Appreciate you taking the time. So, um, you know, when the Fed started their rate hiking cycle after what was an incredibly exuberant market really coming out of COVID, um, you know, looking at playbooks from past cycles, we just expected and believed that there was going to be dislocation in the market. You know, we just, you know, we, I've listened to some of your other podcasts and people talk about the exuberance that was out there and, you know, bid sheets with 30 investors on it and lenders tripping over each other to do deals. It was that kind of market. And the Fed uh, has quickly taken the punch bowl away. And so we knew there was going to be pain and dislocation. Uh, what we didn't know and still really don't know is how quick it will materialize and what it will look like. But looking back at the GFC, where we were in my prior company, we had both an investment vehicle, we were an investment business, but also a large service provider. And we originally started reaching out to lenders and special servicers. Can we buy your debt? Can we buy your notes? Can we take your REO? 
And what we realized is that that they weren't going to move so quickly. And back then, extend and pretend was a very uh, predominant strategy. And so we knew that there would be a time where capital would obviously be needed and, and there would be capitulation in the market. And so we originally started talking about the fund in the summer of 22. Um, but we felt like we were really early at that point. You know, as we, you know, we we started writing a deck, a draft, and we think this might happen and banks may struggle. And then all of a sudden you get in the first quarter of 23 and these things that we were saying should happen, could happen, are starting to happen or did start to happen. So we really, you know, put things together, call it second, third quarter, um, and had our initial fundraising, had a first closing of the fund about uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so now we're operational. And just looking back at our experience from the last cycle, we just know that having you know capital at your disposal versus having to go out and raise it for every deal gives you a significant strategic advantage. All right. So let's talk about that. Uh, one of the things that you said in the, uh, in the article you've reiterated now is we are seeing quote, the same playbook as we've seen in past cycles, of course, referring to the GFC. So what are the similarities and differences between the GFC and today in terms of distress, as far as you see it? I think that will be an easier question to answer in 24 months in the rearview <laughs> year. But if, uh, you know, trying to look at the playbook, um, you know, you, you have many properties with a unsustainable level of leverage. You know, right? You just, I mean, pricing and debt levels and cost of capital were all tied to, everything is priced as you learn in your first economics class or finance class based to the risk-free equivalent, which let's call for real estate 10-year treasury. And when the 10 year is hovering around 1% after COVID and you add a spread on top of that, and, and now it's flirting with five, it's just a very different environment. So the similarities is there's just a tremendous amount of uh, there are a tremendous number of assets that are over leveraged. Uh, big difference is we're sitting here with a very strong economy right now, right? We just got a, a GDP print in the third quarter that I think blew everyone away. Whereas after the GFC, I mean, you know, you had a shopping center, all your shop tenants went out of business because they had taken out home equity lines of credit to open their store and buy three homes and everyone was flipping, you know, there was a much different level of exposure. Now most people are sitting there with a 3% mortgage, so they're not moving, and, you know, at least the homeowners. So very, very different macroeconomic environment. So you're dealing with fundamental, you know, putting office aside, because that's a whole different animal. You're dealing with fundamentals that are still strong, but capital stacks that are impaired. So even on multifamily, which is you know the best asset class, um, we're just seeing situations where people have properties that you know floating rate right debt they didn't quite finish their their business plan, and you know that yield on cost is you know two hundred basis points inside of what a new loan looks like. So. We're early. We're early in the process. Yeah, it's it's hard to disagree with you. You know, the one of the big differences, at least as I see it, was that the uh, global financial crisis was largely driven by residential distress, wasn't it? And today, residential is still very, very strong, but it's commercial uh, that seems to be hit more. And this one comment that you made about extend and pretend. So extend and pretend during the global financial crisis the the sense of pretend was that there was no everyone thought we were just going to keep on going off a precipice this time there's more of a sense that that there is going to be some kind of uh reversal by the fed uh and so the idea is that people are extending or the banks are actually being encouraged to extend and to work with borrowers which they weren't during the global financial crisis does that have an impact on opportunities for you that there is so much extension whether or not it's pretending that the that the crisis is going to come to an end or not but is that going to impact deal flow do you think absolutely i mean deal flow is you know is falling off a cliff you know depending on whose statistics you use generally you know a, a general average you know, number we see thrown around a lot is the transaction volume is down something like 70%. And so I was talking to a top investment sales broker, one of the national firms yesterday, 
-hmm. And he said to me, most of what he does right now is spend his time when he goes into presentations with owners, convincing them not to sell their assets, right? His job is to sell assets. So, you know, I mean, so, you know, I think right now we're at a point where most people feel that the only reason you would sell is you you absolutely have to. Um, Now, in the financial crisis, we had you know, the capital impairment, but we also had, you know, operations and income fall off a cliff across the board, right? I mean, office tenants, you know, went out of bit. I mean, you had office buildings filled with mortgage companies and, and all these things that went out of business overnight. So you had, you know, properties that couldn't meet debt service like that. Shopping centers, your mom and pop tenants went away. You, you think about bankruptcies back then, like linens and things and others that went down. So you you had centers with big boxes suddenly showing up. Um, and then people couldn't afford their rent. So you had apartment defaults spike. Mm-hmm. And so right now we're not seeing that. So it makes sense to extend. But what that does is it clogs up the system, right? So we're t- I talked to bankers, you know, and I'm talking, I mean, like commercial banks, not debt funds and others. But the bankers are saying, we our balance sheet is growing right now just with our unfunded commitments no one is paying off so we therefore have no new capital to make new loans and so that's where things are really just bogged down right now interesting uh yeah so it's a liquid i mean liquidity crunch really and that's uh that's the benefits of having a fund like yours so let's talk about the different buckets uh again just uh i'm gonna rattle them off but would love you to talk about them you've got uh, 75 says again just repeating from the article uh i hope you don't mind david highland uh real estate fund one deploy as much as 75 million in discretional capital commitments 100 million of jv commitments with other funds and 175 million of debt financing so let's start at the top there what are discretional capital commitments? Yeah, so, so that's the fund, right? Highline Real Estate Fund One, or any real estate closed in fund for that matter, is basically a bucket of committed capital that the fund sponsors have the ability to call on to make investments that fit within the fund's parameters. So the fund, so we actually originally started out targeting a $50 million fund, and we were much more successful in our initial closing where we, you know, we thought we, you know, we expected, I think, to raise half of that because we have about a year to raise the capital. Um, and then we we had the ability to go up to 75, but because we exceed our initial capital raise, we're, we're fairly confident we'll hit the 75. So that is the fun. Okay. We also have always done and continue to do acquisitions and joint ventures with some of the larger funds, institutional owners. So if we buy an asset, which we are pursuing, you know, every day um, that is larger than what we'd allocate from the fund. We'll do joint ventures with those other larger partners. So that's that's part of our strategy. We've always had and continue to have. And then, given we're in a constrained debt environment, where in historic normal times you'd say your average leverage is sixty five percent. Now we think the average leverage, at least in the short term, will be closer to fifty percent. And so with the the uh, there's a little bit of confusion in the way the article is written. It's it's really a, a $75 million fund with $350 million of buying power. Got it. Okay. So discretionary capital commitments, That is, does that speak to direct acquisitions then, David? Yes. Well, direct or joint venture. It's basically capital. So that money will be deployed and the fund will buy an asset, will be the sole owner, we will buy it and operate it. Um, we will do a joint venture with various partners that we have. We, we partner with specialists in different fields. So we are, um, we're really specialists in retail and office. So we buy multifamily assets. We have multifamily partners we buy it with. We bought an industrial asset. We buy it with industrial partners. So it could be a strategic partner like that or it could be that larger fund capital partner I mentioned. And then the other thing is we believe a a decent amount of capital will be deployed with existing sponsors. So the the issue now for borrowers is, okay, I have a loan coming due, you know, it was 65 cents on the dollar and a dollar used to be a hundred. So I got a $65 loan. Well, now that value is not a hundred, maybe it's 80 and it doesn't size at a, 8% 8% interest rate or say that depending on your type of debt add those same proceeds. So that, that borrower needs a pay down. 
So there's going to be a point where the lender starts saying, hey, I need this pay down. I, you know, I gave you your first extension because you're a good customer. I gave you your second extension. You know, the world hasn't come to an end. And I think the Fed's posture will switch from, hey, work with your borrowers to start pushing the envelope. And what I think will be interesting this time is you know, going into the financial crisis, like 80% debt was like standard leverage, at least in CMBS world. And you pushed up from there and banks were throwing around 70, 75. And so the the loss was affected the lender, right? There's no question the lender was underwater. Mm -hmm. Put office aside for a second. A lot of properties, the impairment is within the equity stack. The lender is still money good. So the lender will work with their borrower for a period of time, you know, be accommodating. They don't want to shake things up, but there will be a moment where the lender says, well, wait a second, I've given this borrower a year of extensions. I can't do new loans at 7%. I'm sitting with this loan at three and a half. Mm -hmm. And it, I feel bad that the borrower is going to lose their money, but I don't feel that bad. So guess what? It's time to go. It's time to sell. Let's put it out to market. And we're seeing some of that, but I think that's going to start happening more in the next couple of years. All right. So let's drill down on a couple of these ideas. What is a JV exactly? Is this like, a, so a, a sponsor comes to you and they say, hey, we found a deal, a distress deal. We want to buy it. Uh, we need, we'll pick a number, 10 million of equity for this thing. How does a JV structure look uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a wide variety that you just described the JV. That's not necessarily who we are. I mean, there are bigger funds that are so big that their whole mandate, is, you know, if you're, you know, I don't know, if you're a billion dollar fund, you're not going to go operate a billion, you know, billion dollars of equity. Really, you're, you're looking for partners like us and others to deploy uh -huh. that capital. Right. So that's a JV. For us, we're operating first. Our, our, I think our strategic advantage is that we try to find, well, I, I just, our, our investment strategy is to try to find a strategic advantage when we buy property, whether that means an off market deal that we source because we know the players in the market, whether it means we get put on a deal because of a national retail tenant relationship who says they want to be there or, or uh -huh. be in an area, we go find that opportunity. So, we will do JVs, but we're not the passive, hey, here's money, send us a report. We're, we're looking to, we have capital that will deploy directly or in partnerships, but we also have expertise. And I think part of our strategy is to do things where we don't just add value because we have money, but we add value because we've been doing this a long time. Uh, all right. So now let's talk about the uh, the debt. So you mentioned pay down. This is very interesting. So you've got some sponsors as you well know, that uh, either could use a pay down on their on their existing debt in order to reduce uh, the debt uh, year, or the the uh, the debt burden, so that they hit the right DSCRs, etc. Uh, and then uh, you also have sponsors who are looking for uh, rate caps, right? They want to they want to buy another rate cap, for example. So what kind of what kind of debt are you looking at? Uh, providing is it pref equity is it like how do you structure your your that debt we are not yeah there was a little bit of uh, uh maybe I'm, uh, things were written wrong we're not providing debt our you know, our, our we would provide pref equity okay so on that so i think the best way to describe it is that we have flexible capital looking to solve problems, right? Where there is an opportunity to add value, not just through the deployment of the capital, but also through some level of expertise. And so, yes, the situation you ex just described is something we're seeing on a daily basis, right. right? It's, I've got this loan, it could be the interest rate cap. I mean, that's a really painful check to write right? they yeah. are aren't they i mean they've it's gone from twenty thousand to millions you know it's, a, it's a significant number and and what's also you know difficult about that is it's not like you feel like you're advancing the value of the asset right it's one thing if someone comes in and says hey i need two million dollars because i'm going to finish my upgrade to my units and get more rent and drive value it's another thing to say i'm going to buy an interest rate cap so i can prepay interest instead of pay it over the next year 
right? So, um, but that's that's part of what you need to do to keep a deal alive. Um, so, you know, that's definitely part of it. Um, I don't think we'd be overly excited about that type of investment is just funding a cap. And if there's nothing else going on, um, you know, we want to see, we want to see some opportunity for value enhancement, particularly when you're in a macro environment where values are coming down. I got it. I see. Interesting. All right. So let's talk about the different asset classes that you like. You've, uh, you've nodded your head a few times about office. So why don't we start with office and also, Let's talk about office because you're focused on the Southeast, particularly in Florida, uh, which is, as far as I can tell, a world of its own. <laughs> it might as well be in another country uh, in comparison. You know, it's California, L.A. and San Francisco and New York, et cetera, particularly with office. So what are you seeing with office? And then let's talk about some of the other asset classes, particularly in Florida and how it compares with other markets in the country. It is a very, very interesting and uncertain um, yeah, story that, I, you know, I don't know exactly how it's going to be told out. You know, in South Florida, um, we are seeing office fundamentals that in some sub-markets are orders of magnitude better than we've ever seen. I mean, really? Brickle, A rents, you know, that pre-COVID were... 60 are firmly above 100 bucks a foot now, and there's very little space. So that was just a crazy boom that happened. You know, it's leveled off a little bit, but we're seeing demand throughout markets, most of our markets. You know, the the area that even in South Florida, I I just still have no reading on. Well, let me say it differently. When you think about the future of office, I do believe that people will go back to the office. I think that, you know, how do young people learn whatever craft or trade they're in, how do you develop culture, talent, all those things. What I have no real sense of is what happens with the call center or or, or use where there's just a lot of bodies doing monotonous tasks where they can come in and get trained once a week, once a month, where they can be monitored remotely, you know, assuming they have adequate facilities at home with the dog barking and the this, that, and the other, <laughs> that type of office space, I'm not, I'm not, I have no visibility on how to look at it. And so I think the fundamentals of quality also office are strong. You can look at reports that different groups have done and depending on whether you believe it's the top seven or the top 10% of office product almost anywhere has seen rent growth through this whole period of time, New York, Chicago, I don't know about San Francisco, but even in markets that, you know, everyone paints with a really negative brush. So I think office has a future. Um, We're looking at class A institutional style, you know, quality office buildings right now where like there's no institutional capital showing up. Um, it is a, you know, so the opportunity to buy quality right now, if you find the right seller and you are finding institutional sellers who say they have to exit is very interesting. Um, now there are some deals that have traded, I think that have gotten really strong pricing. The seller should be thrilled about, but I think that's a great area and an opportunity. Um, you know, I think, but we're seeing so much suburban commodity, non-upgraded just sinking ship office that you know i don't think we wouldn't touch right now Mm. um but it's going to be entered what's going to happen in the office market is sooner than we all think a tremendous amount of the product in the market will be out of the market meaning you'll have zombie ownership like office is very capital intensive compared to other asset classes you know, you spend on average 30% of NOI reinvesting in TIs and else lease of commissions and capital every year. And so most people, other than the institutional long-term holders, buy office deals with floating rate debt on three to five-year business plans. Mm-hmm. And that money is running out, right? You funded your business plan, and even in South Florida, you execute on it, but now you're out of capital. And now you say, well, what's my cap rate before I reinvest in this thing? And you probably don't feel good about it if you're thinking today. You don't feel good about it today. And so there's just going to be a lot of owners where the partners say, we're not going to fund anymore. And so they're just, buildings are going to sit there without investment and they're not going to compete for tenants. So the real market is going to be a fraction of the size of what the denominator 
appears to be in terms of who's really in the game and not. So it's going to be an interesting market for many years to come. Why do you think uh, Florida is so strong for office at the moment? Relative well, we just to had LA. LA. Yeah, sorry. We had an incredible in migration. You know, after COVID, um, we just had all these companies decide to open offices down here. Um, and other businesses followed, you know, tech titan, not tech, I mean, mostly um, financial services and hedge funds. You think Citadel and mm. Tama Bravo and all these groups came from high crime, high tax states. And, you know, we'll see. I mean, by, by the way, you know, most of these tents aren't even open really in their permanent facilities yet because they sign new leases and buildings under construction. And so, um, but there's a whole new ecosystem where people who live, you know, high net worth people who live in those markets kind of got used to, well, maybe I'll spend six months in a year and a day in South Florida, have my office there, go back and forth to New York, you know, and, and there's just been a huge push of that. And so that drove a lot of demand for office. And then just the general uplift in commerce for everything that was associated with that, the house purchases, the renovations, the buy the, buy the boat, buy the cars, and the kids at school, all those things have just elevated the rest of the economy. Uh, and uh, with, do you guys do uh, JVs with uh, office, other office partners, or do you, yes, just, you will do JV? Absolutely. And so what will a JV like that look like? So office deals tend to be bigger. So we actually have a um, an operating partner group called Square Two Capital that we have invested in office deals. They are vertically integrated, meaning they have management, construction management services and house. Mm -hmm. We outsource all of those services. So um, they're our partner in pursuing office deals. And then, like I said, most office deals are better. So um, we would have a larger fund partner as well in those deals. Interesting. So office, yeah. And I mean, we, we, we see, we haven't acted on a tremendous flow of inquiries from existing office sponsors who are trying to obtain capital to solve the problems that we just talked about, right? I need a loan pay down, I need to replenish my reserve. So we'll evaluate those opportunities. But like we're gonna be very selective in office. I think office has always been an asset class that moves slower than the other, both to hit bottom and to recover just by virtue of the duration of leases and things of that nature. And I don't think there'll be any difference this time. Are you seeing any opportunistic opportunities? <laughs> Sorry, opportunistic acquisition opportunities. I hate to use that same word twice. In Florida yet? For office, particularly? Like heavily um, discounted. Yeah, I mean, they're there. For, yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, what's your definition of opportunistic? If you're talking based on returns, like, hey, you know, does an office deal under it? Does it... Most people would say opportunistic returns mean, you know, north of a 20 levered whatever you can lever these days IRR right. I don't think anyone's underwriting an office deal that isn't north of a 20 even if it doesn't have an opportunistic profile meaning in terms of vacancy and the size of the capital lift so I would argue that almost any office deal that would be deemed opportunistic right now I mean we talk to our large capital partners not all of them there's you know about office and you know common line I get from our acquisition you know counterpart there is i wouldn't want to bring an office deal to committee because if i think if i walked in with it i think i'd get fired <laughs> I mean, and, and that that sentiment is changing a little bit but you have to think that a lot of the large funds are loaded up with office already so part of people's view on office is how much defense are they having to play versus how much offense you know fortunately we sold most of our office portfolio even prior to covid so, um, you know, we don't really have one office project right now that we're involved with. And so we're not dealing with the headaches that large scale office operators are dealing with. Right. The legacy issues. So what about other asset classes, uh, David, uh, like uh, multifamily? What's going on in Florida and multifamily? So multifamily had a tremendous run of rent growth through most Florida markets. Um, it's flattened out to some degree. The biggest uh, issue behind, or I don't even know what's behind, 
um, but in line with the financing market, so it's insurance. Wow. Insurance on multifamily assets in Florida has just uh, gone through the roof. I mean, just by order of magnitude, I've heard stories of properties where insurance cost $800 per unit per year, going up to 4000 I mean, that's like, you know, quality new product, you know, with whatever lender requires the most stringent replacement cost numbers. So that's been a big hit. Um, and it's really about valuations. We talked about before, you know, people leaned in hard for multifamily. Cap rates were incredibly low. And, you know, the big, I guess the big struggle kind of across the board right now is, you know, everything pretty much prices at um, almost a negative spread to debt, right? There's nothing, we haven't built back that spread. No sellers want to say, okay, I acknowledge the fact that like great fixed rate debt is north of seven. So my cap rate should- So I'm going to sell it to seven or an eight. Not a nine, it doesn't happen. And so if you think about that, like you used to be able to make your return, you know, I don't know, some deals we'd make, more seventy percent of our return in cash flow and thirty percent back ended, and others it's fifty fifty. And obviously, the more return you make along the way, the less back ended, the better. Now it's got to be all back ended, so that, it makes it very difficult to transact. And so, multi, you know, still has strong fundamentals. I do hear of softening. I, you know, I've heard rumors and I talked to friends who are developers that were developed new product and they were, you know, leasing out 30 units a month and then it dropped to 20 and then they gave some concessions and there's a little bit of that going on. And I think overall, you know, there's a decent, there's a, there's a significant amount of supply in the pipeline that's going to deliver behind that. There are all these multi deals that haven't got on the ground yet that are stuck in the mud. And so multi is interesting because I think you're going to have a couple of years of, of choppy, you know, waters there, right? You got your debt issues, you got your insurance issues, and you're probably going to have greater competition for tenants and maybe even increasing concessions and declining rents. But you get on the other side of that, you know, like, well, no one started any new deals. And, you know, from called second half of 23 to, I don't know, you tell me, you know, 20 to 25. Exactly. So there's going to be a gap. There's going to be a lull in deliveries. And I think the market will absorb and we'll all wake up in two years and say, oh, we, you know, we're under, we don't have enough apartments again. Well, that's exactly right, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> the growth of multifamily is it's, uh, it's kind of flat lines. And then there's a sudden explosion because everybody starts putting permits in. And then there's this huge release of units on the market and then it stops again. So it kind of, it's like a step. It's not a straight line. Yeah, uh, but I don't know what happens. I mean, we're look, we're not, that's, you know, we will invest in multi with best in class partners. But, you know, we looked at a lot of multi development deals a year ago, two years ago, where people were looking for partners, different things. The middle of the road deal was underwritten at a, I don't know, five and a half, five and three quarter untrended yield on cost. You know, that number got hit by insurance. I'm sure the cost component, you know, construction costs are still going up. So I'm sure there's some budget busts there. You know, you weren't underwriting carrying the debt at the same cost. You weren't under, underwriting a multi-million dollar cap. So those loans are going to mature and, you know, but in, or, or those properties are going to deliver. And then there's going to be some interesting discussions around those too, I think. You know, where, where do they stand? What's the, what leverage is the lender really out that that point you know can't refinance necessarily you know if you're delivering at a i don't know now is your five and a half now a five is it a say you know but your bar you know your, your negative leverage again so that's going to be interesting as well on the permanent financing side of course yes. these deals that are coming out the ground let me ask you one more question on this point just to clarify because i'm still not 100 percent sure you said you invest with best of class sponsors so again is that a passive role you you act like a private equity fund or when you say no, you we would passive. generally look to be a uh we'd be a co-gp we would we would have decision making authority in those cases yeah so all right that's that that's what i thought that's what i yeah. thought yeah. um all right so let me uh let me ask you a couple more questions before we wrap up i do try to keep these podcasts down to 
every, I'm sorry for everybody that's heard me say this multiple times. The same joke. My wife complains. My kids, compl- they have a list of all my standard jokes. Uh, but I try to keep the podcast down to average drive time, commute time in America, which is 30 minutes. But I'm in California, so we could go for three hours uh, yeah. for average commute time. But uh, but let's just try and keep it down. Um, so a couple of questions. First of all, you mentioned uh, raising capital. So how do you raise capital? What are, like, what are your... Like what kind of investors invest with you? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, the, the what we've experienced or understand, we've talked some institutions and others, is that fund one, you're not getting institutional investors. You have to establish a track record as a fund operator to, to hmm. get institutional capital. So really it was all private and, you know, a, a, a decent, I don't have the exact breakdowns, but... A decent percentage were existing investors. We've done many deals over the years where we raise capital um, to buy shopping centers and other assets. And so investors who have been with us for a long time and had good results were excited to get in the fund. Um, and then, um, you know, just other high net worth individuals that we know or met or other things. But one thing that I think is unique about our our fund, uh, our investor group, is we have a lot of very strategic real estate professionals who are investors. So we've got people who are best in class leasing experts and office and retail and other, you know, a regional head of retail leasing for the Southeast for a company. We've got investment sale pros and different asset classes. We've got uh, finance brokers. And so um, a lot of these professionals not only, you know, help in, in things that you know, are there as a resource if you need them, but they're also sourcing opportunities, right? So, you know, someone who's out selling deals and also an investor in this fund, you know, hey, I heard of this opportunity, so-and-so needs rescue capital, maybe you should uh, give a call. So we, we definitely have a lot of strategic groups in the fund that we think will not only help source opportunities, but will also help execute opportunities. That is extremely interesting. It's like a value add investor, right? It's like your investors are also bringing deals. What an interesting. Yeah. Idea. I mean, we've done that forever. Like as a, you know, I'm going back even in my prior company, you know, we, when we would raise capital to buy something, we would invite top brokers uh, really, actually, was yeah. We'd invite top brokers at different firms who are our friends. Hey, you want to invest in this deal? Because obviously, those brokers are out and they're making money and they're doing their thing, and they don't always have the opportunity to be on the the other side. And we also think it's a great endorsement when someone who's a pro in the industry says, "Yeah, I like your deal and I want to invest in it." That that gives us a level of comfort, and you know, we also think it was a, a great endorsement for the fund. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? So what is the minimum investment uh, for for these guys in your fund? So the minimum, the, the targeted minimum is $500,000. And, and that, you know, when someone's raising a fund, that really is driven by the way you deal with SEC counts and number of investors and things of that nature. But oh. um, we, we've gone smaller. I think our average investor is something like $700,000. Well, hang on, you've gone small. You mean you've gone bigger? We've taken smaller investors. Five hundred is our stated minimum. We have a session oh, to take it, like the strategic investors I mentioned. We've we've let some people in for smaller, but I think our average invest, our average checks about our average commitment is about seven hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, actually, to just jump in. So this, I wasn't expecting you to say that, but I do have to ask. You mentioned limitations on numbers. Uh, is that because, sorry to get technical on you, and it's okay if, if uh, this is just a little bit too deep, but is that because you're running 506B offerings that you're limited to the number of people that you can actually bring in to invest in the fund? You know, I had we've had extensive discussions with our attorneys about all the different parameters. I don't recall the this, this section number. Okay, so I think okay. it probably is. It's the 100 investor. Yeah, 99. Yeah. And so it begs the question, why aren't you doing a 506C? Let's talk about that just for a few minutes after, because it's too heavily in the weeds to get into that now. Let me wrap up, though, with two more questions, if I may ask for right now. That's it. I was talking to somebody yesterday that felt that they were handcuffed to the limited number, but you're really not. The world has changed. I mean, that's- right, We'll talk about ever. that after. <laughs> yes. Let me ask you, so, so how are you, de- how, apart from your strategic investor partners, how else are you sourcing deals? Are you looking at notes? 
from banks? Or, like, how are you sourcing deals? Sure. I mean, we source it. So, you know, obviously we're in the flow of deals from the brokerage community. So marketed deals come our way as they always do. Mm -hmm. um, we have a network of, I don't know what the right word, independent brokers who we might point in a direction. Hey, we really like this area, this street, go call every shopping center owner ah. see who might want to sell. Um, we are constantly meeting with debt brokers, owners, you know, banks, lenders, special servicers, debt funds. So, you know, that's that's what we do. I mean, we're, we're out there, you know, we you have a lot, you know, how many days a week do you go to a lunch and a breakfast and a coffee? I mean, it's constantly sourcing and having conversations and making people aware of what, what we're up to and that we have the fund and and, um, you know, things come in through that, basically. I mean, you know, we've all, I mean, I, what I'm, I'm probably flirting with 30 years in the business. You know, Matt is 10 years younger than me. Dave is like seven years younger than him. Andrew's, you know, we, we, we have people sourcing at different tranches and different generations and age groups who have their peer groups. So it, it's a, uh, and then there's a lot of strategic thinking, right? What, what do we what do we want to source specifically? Let's put together a list of, you know, every office building that is newer than X, that's smaller than Y, that's in a market with a population of, of something else. So we have different um, technological capabilities where we can overlay cell phone data, traffic data, demographic information and to come up with targets like that. All right, now I'm going to ask you one final question. I love asking this question because you can't get it wrong. <laughs> but still, nobody really wants to make predictions. But I'm going to ask you anyway to predict. We are now coming. What are we? Oh, goodness. Almost the end of October. I can't believe how fast it's going. 2023. Towards the end of the year, going into 24. What are your predictions for the market in Florida and for the opportunities that you're going to see? What's going to be happening over the next few months? I think very little is going to happen over the next few months. I think that if you look at the timing of maturities, you can kind of think about when when people bought, right? I mean, think about it. 2020, we were locked down with COVID. We weren't really buying. The market didn't pick up till the end of 2020. And then 21, it was on steroids in the first half of 22. So add three years to those time frames. That's your those are your floating rate deals mm -hmm. for the most part. So that, that puts you at 24, 25. You know, I think we're within a couple of Fed meetings from, I think, from the end of the hiking cycle, but who knows? I think we've got this really odd dichot you know, conflict out there. We've got a strong economy, maybe because the government's still stepping on the gas, right? Go back to Econ 101. If you want to stimulate economy, the government should deficit spend. Well, you shouldn't deficit spend when we're trying to combat inflation. So you got the government stepping on the gas, the right. Fed stepping on the brakes. So that's that's really where we're uncertain. But I think when the rate hiking ends and, you know, then the question is, when when does the cutting happen, Right. Right. But but I think really where where people are what people are waiting for, there's there's this belief by many that well rates will come back. We'll come back to what? Not come back to one percent ten year we had with free COVID money, and maybe not come probably not come back to a two percent ten year we had after the GFC when we had quantitative easing forever. So if you think maybe the 10 year is like a four percent number, then people say, Okay, now I can make decisions based on that. I'm a little bit underwater. I'm a lot of bit underwater. And, and then things start to move. So I still think we're clogged up for several quarters and we start really seeing things, you know, second half of 24 and a 25 with, with dribbles here and there. I mean, you know, there's going to be distress along the way, but if you ask bulk volume, bulk activity, when does the party really get started? It's second half of 24 fascinating all right well uh david moret founder and president highline real estate cap what a pleasure thank you so much for joining Thanks. me on the show today yeah my pleasure great take care everyone all right that was david moret founder and president of highline real estate capital in miami david thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today it was very interesting to talk to you i am looking forward to possibility of talking to you some more about 
how you can raise capital from individual investors in unlimited amounts and taking on unlimited investors. That is what we do. So if you are listening and you're interested in how to raise capital from accredited investors in unlimited numbers and unlimited amounts of money, do let me know there at gowcrowd.com. You can email me at adam at gowcrowd.com and I'll send you some more information about that. And of course, thank you to dear viewers for tuning in today. I hope you found the conversation with David of interest. We may well, I love asking people for predictions. I asked David for a prediction. So maybe he and I will revisit sometime at the end of or middle of next year, just to see how things are evolving. Again, thank you so much for joining me today. I will see you next time. But for now, this is Adam Gower signing off.